This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com Okay, good evening everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Good to see everyone. Um, so we have a few very interesting questions this evening. And with Seat Deshmaya, we will share some thoughts regarding uh, what was asked. Question number one. Um, and the reason why I'm answering it first is because it actually resonated with me very much because I, I had um, basically the same thoughts or in a similar vein. Um, question is, you know, we've been davening uh, our, on our own for the last two months or so. And I'll tell you just my personal feeling. I daven in my office. I, before I start davening, I clean it. I like to have like a very clean table. I don't know, it, it gets me, it helps me just clear my mind. And I daven at my pace. Um, you know, over the years I've learned different things to have in mind by davening. But I'll tell you the truth, by, by uh, when I daven with a minion, I'm under the gun, you know. For example, I'll just give you a quick example. You know, in the Magen Avram says in Ahav Rabba, you're supposed to have in mind the Sheish Zechirois. You know, most people, um, either they don't say the Sheish Zechirois, or, or they say it at the end of davening, but actually, the, the, the ideal time to think about those six events, namely, what happened to Miriam, what we're supposed to do to Amalek, Maimon Har Sinai, Kabbalah Satoira, the Egel, the, the Magen Ram says you're supposed to think it at the end of Ava Rabbah. So when you say, that God gave us a mouth to thank Him, and not to speak Lashon Hara like Miriam, the Magen Ram says. And Biahava, God loves us now, but when we did the Egel, you know, the love wasn't so great. And when you say Lashimcha Hagadol, say Hashem's name is great, and I'm only trying to make it small. Okay, so I try, and I actually, and I have a very good Siddur, I highly recommend getting the Siddur Masak Midvash. It has, it like writes in the Siddur, like what you should think. It's like, it's a good, they have good checkpoints. The bottom line is, when you're diving with the Minyan, um, you're under the gun. You know, you have to keep up. You have to start Shemona Esri with the Tzibor. Sometimes it's not your pace. Sometimes it's too fast, too slow. You're getting distracted. And you know, this, this is on maybe on, uh, on one level. On, on, on another level, uh, sometimes it's just hard to have Kavana. And when somebody's on their own, perhaps they're able to have uh, greater Kavana. And you sort of ask yourself, so then uh, maybe I'm better off without the Minion. Um, the truth is, uh, someone confided in me, and, and I would think it's probably true in many cases that it's just the opposite, that they find that when they're at, when they're at home, they're not able to be mechavin at all, let alone even say all the words. Some people have a very hard time davening on their own, and I tell, I'll tell you the truth, when I started, when I started with this, uh, if I'm on an airplane, I have a hard time davening. It's very hard for me. I'm used, because I was so used, I'm so used to davening with a minion. But once I got into the routine of davening on my, by my, myself, I actually like it. Uh, but mo- many people don't feel that's the case. Now, I'm going to tell you a great story. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, and I think everybody, I think if we're honest, we'll, we'll all admit that this is true. Um, a story with uh, Harav Vigdor Miller. So he was once benching. And when he finished benching, he turned to the guy next to him and he says, Thank you for the benching. So the guy said, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> You bench, not me. So Miller says, I know, but you were watching me, and I benched better because you were watching me. Now you have to be a big person to admit that you do things better when people are watching. And I think most people will acknowledge that they probably daven better in the shul because there are other people around. You know, like Rebbe Lezer said, Halavai, that our fear of God should be uh, the way we fear other people. But there is, I think, a certain uh, idea and a certain uh, true idea that there are levels of kavanah you could have when you're on your own. Maybe you could meditate more. Maybe you're not as ashamed, perhaps, to uh, let out one's kavanah. So maybe it's better to daven on one's own. Certainly, let's say, certainly, let's say you're at, uh, upon occasion. Let's say you know you have a big hisoyros and you want to have tremendous kavanah. Maybe you can make the case that it's uh, better to daven on your own. So the basic halachic answer to this is uh, Rav Moshe actually deals with this exact question in Archaim Chela Gimel Simen Zayin. 
בדבר אחד שמרגיש כשמספר ביחידס מכוון הסליבו יוצר לשמיים. Somebody feels he has more kavana when he davens by himself. Now, I want to share with you something amazing. I don't know, maybe it's not even, um, it's not even kedai to say, but you should be aware of it. Is somebody obligated to, to daven with a minion? Do you have an absolute chiv to daven with a minion? So, it's very interesting. You know, Rav Asher Weiss came out now with 172 pages of tshuvas on Corona. I have a whole... You can print it out if anybody wants the link. I'll be happy to share with you. 172 pages on, on Tshuvas on Corona. So he deals with the question, Tfila B'Tzibor, is it a Chiv or a Mitzvah? And if you look in the Shulchan Aruch, the Shulchan Aruch says in Simon Tzadi, Yishtadel Adam L'Hispalel B'Beis HaKnesses. You should try. You should try. Does that sound like a Chiv to you? And then this comes from the tour. The Torah says, Tzarech l'heshtadel b'chol koichai. You need to try with all your energy. But does that sound like an obligation? And Rav Moshe has a tshuva, and Rav Moshe says a chidosh. That you're obligated. It's a chiyov. And Rav Moshe explains why the language of the Shulchan Aruch is try if you really have to. But interestingly, Rav Asher Weiss takes on his shoulders that in his opinion, it's not a chiyov. You just have to do everything you can to make sure you're there. But he, but it goes, it stops just short of saying you're chayiv. Now, I uh, I uh, learned, uh, understood, or or learned like Rav Moshe, or maybe I saw Rav Moshe years ago, and I think that's the normative approach that uh, it's a chiyiv. But just be aware that the language of the Shulchan Aruch doesn't seem to indicate that, and. There are poiskim who say otherwise, but I think the more accepted approach is, yes, it's an absolute obligation. I mean, Rav Asher Weiss deals with the question, if you're not obligated, then, then why do you have to travel um, four miles to go to a minion? So how is it, I need to try, I need to try and go four miles? That, Rav Moshe says, means you're chayev. Okay, but look, we're going to go with Rav Moshe. Rav Moshe was, for America, poisek achroin, but yesh lefalpel. Rav Moshe says like this, what's the obligation of tefillah? Rav Moshe says a very big chiddush. Rav Moshe says, as long as you could be mechavin for the first bracha of Shemana Esrei, and this way you'll be yoytze, you're required to daven with a minion, even if you'll have much better kavana all, on, all by yourself. Why? Says Rav Moshe, the mitzvah of tefillah is not to be mechavin. The mitzvah of tefillah is that your, your tefillah should be niskabel. And the Gemara tells us when you daven with a minion, to some degree your tefillahs are always niskabel. Now obviously, we could try to understand. You know, we ask for things, we don't always get them. But whatever that means, niskabel, the Gemara says, hein kel kaber v'layimas, that God never despises the tefillah of the tzibor. Which means, in some way, the offering of the tzibor is always accepted to an extent. Masha'in Kain says, Rav Moshe, you could be the God of Hadar and you daven on your own and there are no guarantees. And therefore, says Rav Moshe, one is obligated to daven in a fashion that his tefillah will be effective. Even if that means that your personal um, feeling of his sorrows will be lacking, even if your personal spiritual growth you feel may be stunted, the obligation of tefillah, basically, we're not davening for us, we're davening because we have responsibility. You know, there's a <laughs> duality in our relationship with Hashem. On the one hand, we're Banim. And on the other hand, we're Avodim. And I saw something very interesting. Um, I saw a briskarav on Malachi. This really struck me. I saw this very recently. There's a pasuk in Malachi that Hashem says, V'chamalti aleichem, I'm going to have mercy on you. Kasher yach malish, like a man has mercy, al, al haben ha'oyved oisai, on a child who serves him. That God says, I'll have mercy on you, like, like a person has mercy on their child who serves him. So, the uh, briskarav wants to know, wait a second, if we're already a ben, so what mercy is there more than a father having mercy on a son? 
Isn't that the greatest mercy in the world? Kerachim of Albanim. No, Rabbi Shem said, have mercy on you like a ben ha'oivid say, like a son who serves his father. And the Brisker basically says that, yes, a, a child has the closest relationship, but it's not necessarily the greatest uh, relationship of devotion. There's a higher level of relationship than just a child. Like, the epitome of a relationship with Hashem is to be, after feeling closeness to Hashem, then going and dedicating ourselves to His avoida, almost like an Eved. The Lashem is a Rashbam in Baba Basra. A Ben serves his father, but an Eved serves Yoyser Midai. A ben, uh, an Eved is extra dedicated. You know, I, I had a thought very recently. I'm going to tell you, um, last week, that based on this idea of the Briskarav, we say, Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, we don't say, Malkeinu Avinu, which I would have expected, if you think about it, first we should say, God, I'm your servant, and you're my king, that's a lower level, and, and even a higher level, is I'm your child, and, and, uh, and you're my father. We should say, Malkeinu, that's the lower level, and then Avinu, isn't Avinu a higher level? But it seems like th- there's two levels of Malkeinu. There's the Malkeinu that precedes Avinu. But that's not what we're aiming for. We're not aiming, oh, first I'm an Eved, and then I move up to a higher level Ben. I'm so close to Hashem. The highest Madrega is to be an Eved after you're a Ben. The way some explain it, you know, with your father, okay, you love your father, you're going to serve your father. But sometimes you might take the easy way out. Sometimes you feel a little close, maybe a little... You don't have a kniya or a hachna or a shif. There's a, a madrega of being an evid after being a ben. So, when it comes to tefillah, yes, meh, in a way, it might uh, be stunting your, your feelings of spiritual elation. But tefillah is responsibility. So ultimately, we're, we're, we are responsible to daven in a way that the tefillah will be most effective. And maybe we won't get the same uh, feeling of spiritual aliyah, but um, in terms of our responsibility, um, despite the fact that your kavana will be less, nobody's saying your kavana, we're, we're granting the question. In other words, even if your kavana will be much, much more by yourself, but the point is, you got to get the tefillahs answered, and you have a guarantee to some level your tefillahs will be answered with the minion. Okay, so hopefully that was something uh, meaningful regarding that question. Next question. I love this question too. If a reputable Rav gives a psaq halacha that turns out to be wrong, does the person who follows the psaq halacha get dinged for not doing the right thing? Or rather a mitzvah because he followed the psaq? I'm looking if... Uh, it's a very interesting question, no? In other words, you ask a Rav a question and he, he's wrong. It happens all the time. I want to tell you a very big chiddush. I'm going to tell you it's not a halacha. It's something that I learned over the last couple of years. It's not something I learned from a sefer. It's something I learned from life experience. There was an Adam Gadol that one time... Um, I, th- I think I mentioned this. I think he. I, I thought he. I think he made a mistake, and because of that, I uh, sort of hesitated to gain from this person because I think he made a mistake. And till today, I think he made a mistake. And I realized maybe a couple years ago that I made a very big mistake, because you know what? Every great person makes mistakes, and if you're going to write someone off who you think made a mistake, you're never going to learn from anybody. There's nothing wrong with thinking, you know what, he made a mistake, but in all likelihood, he's an Adam Gadol, he makes less mistakes than I make. I'm more prone to mistake. The Masil Susharm says that an Adam, the, 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 the nature of a Basar Adam, is that we are closer to error than to getting something correct. So, if a, there's a whole Masechta, Masechta Hariyos. What's Masechta Hariyos? When an entire Bezdin makes a mistake. Anyway, if you ask a Rav Shaila and he turns out to be wrong, do you get dinged? So, um, the answer is, there's a Piskei Tshuva in Yaradea. 
Tzitzke Tshuva says like this, if you ask a loymeid, if you ask Stam, a guy, you know, uh, I met a guy in the back of the shul, this guy, he's mamish a Talmud Chacham, he knows shas on his fingertips. He's not, a, he's not what we call a reputable Paisek. He's not, he's not a known Paisek. He's a Talmud Chacham. He's a loymeid. The Piskei Tshuva says, if you ask a loymeid a question, and he got it wrong, and you relied on him, you're amazed. But you have to ask, the Lushen of the um, Piskei Tshuva says, you have to ask, Poiskim for Samim. You ask, has somebody who has a reputation for knowing Halacha. And then if you relied on him, you're, uh, you're an oinus. You're an oinus. What did I do here? Um... One second. So the bottom line is, if you ask a reputable Paisek uh, Halacha and he got it wrong, it's not on you. If you asked a loymeda question, then it's on you. But I want to just clarify a few things. You walked into Shul, like close to Mincha time, and you overheard the Rav giving a shear, and you overheard the Rav say, you know, you're allowed to do X, Y, and Z, and then you're Soymech on it, you're amazed. If the Rav said it wrong, you're amazed. You cannot be Soymech, La halacha on anything you hear in a shir. Not only that, you're waiting online to speak to the rav, and you overhear somebody, somebody asking the rav a shaila. I say, well, you know, the rav told Ruvain, so I'm going to follow that. If the rav got it wrong, you're amazed. Third of all, you ask a rav a shaila, and you say, you know, I was just wondering, what would the halacha be in such and such case? And you don't tell the Rav it's Noigea you now, and the Rav gives you a psak, and you follow it, and he's wrong, you're amazed. Because the Rav never heard that you need to know the halacha now, Lamaisa. However, if you ask a shaila with, with the proper covered uh, rosh, meaning you say, listen, listen Rav, I, uh, is Noigea me a shaila now, I need to know what to do. Okay, that's a different story, that's a different level of responsibility that the Talmud Chacham takes upon himself, and you follow him, then you're an oinus. Pres- um, um, provided that you asked somebody who's capable of giving a proper answer. Next question. If one gets a psak halacha from a rav, but he thinks the rav is wrong, does he need to follow the psak halacha of the rav, or can he ask another paisik? He's not certain the rav is wrong, but he thinks the rav is wrong. Let's talk about a different shayla. I ask a rav a shayla, and I don't like the answer. Am I allowed to ask another rav? No. It's Allah in Shachnach and Yaradeya Simon Reish Membeis. It's a Rama. If you ask, once you ask a shayla, um, you can't you can't ask another rav. But what if you think the rav is wrong? It's a very hard question to answer. Why do you think he's wrong? Based on what? Based on your knowledge of halacha? Based on your knowledge of mitzvahs? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, that you don't like the, uh, tarots, based on what? That you don't like the answer. So. Exactly. <laughs> right, who is that? Who, who just said that? Okay. Avi. Avi. Avi Hager, wow, how are you? Okay. Um, next question. What is the source of, of the minog of staying up Shavuos night? How much should one push to stay up during these times? Is it better to go to sleep and learn, dur- learn during the day if staying up will ruin your day? What's the source for learning Shavuos night? The first time the Minog is mentioned is 2,000 years ago, I believe in the Zayar, where it says that you know big tzaddikim and big uh, gedolim would stay up all night, and that's all it remained. Only the greatest Tamei Chachamim stayed up all night until about 400-500 years ago. There's a story that Rabbi Shlomo al Kabitz and the Beis Yosef were learning in Turkey together. And uh, they were up all night. And the, the, the soul of the Mishnah revealed itself to them. And from there it became widespread to stay up all night Shavuos. What's the reason for it? So one of the reasons given is that when Hashem offered us the Torah, so um, there was a certain degree of atzlos in receiving the Torah. We didn't wake up on time. Um, Rav Tzadik HaKoyen explains the reason why we went to sleep is because we thought we would get the Torah of Nevuah. In order to get Nevuah, you have to uh, be in a state of sleep. So we went to sleep to be able to be Makabal the Torah. 
some even say that the reason why we stay up all night is we know that we, when the Rav Hashem gave us a Torah, even though we said Nasa Venishma, we said Nasa Venishma to the Torah Shebal Peh, but to the Torah Shebech Sav, excuse me, but for the Torah Shebal Peh, Hashem had a, you know, ram it down our throats. It was Kaf Aleim Har Kegigas. So we have to be misaki in that. So we stay up all night learning Dafka Torah Shebal Peh. That's the Yashrish Yaakov. But don't we have Kim of Kiblu when it comes to Purim? Yeah, so some say Purim is the uh, is when we were Mikhail Tarsha Peh, you know, Berat Sain, but the, this is a tikkun of we're, we're, we're trying to Mikhail the Tarsha Baal Peh, Berat Sain, even on Shavuos. But the bottom line is it's a minag. So this is the most important, this is a very important Yisaid, a very uh, uh, Pashat Yisaid, but something that um, sometimes we lose focus on. Sorry, my, I see I have an unstable connection. You hear me? Sorry. Uh, and that is, we get very... Um, Jews love minhagim as well as they should. However, we have to understand that a minhag is a minhag. But there's also, uh, there's halacha, and there's drabanons, and there are dairaisas, which are much more important. So for instance, if by staying up all night, that means, lamashal, you're not, you're, you're not going to daven with kavana then, uh, you know, that's a serious question. Is it worthwhile staying up all night if I'm not going to be able to daven? Because davening is a, a chiv. I have to daven with kavana. Staying up all night is, all, is a minog. Or worse, you know, if I stay up all night, then I'm going to miss the suda the next day. So then you're not allowed to stay up all night. In other words, minhagim are beautiful, provided that they don't cause you to violate actual halachas. So how much should one push to stay up during these times? I would think to stay up all night by yourself in your house, maybe with a kid or two, is a very difficult thing to do. I don't... Um, look, if you're able to do it, then ma If you're able to do it and daven properly, ma But you ask, um, if staying up will ruin my day, I don't think anybody would say to stay up if it's going to ruin your day. If you could stay up and take a nice nap the next day and then learn the next day and daven properly, then it's a good thing to do. If it's going to infringe on your fulfillment of any mitzvah, then you can't do it. Um, but I would suspect that if you're not in shul with, together with the chabura, it's probably a very, very difficult thing to do. Okay, next question. What is the source of... Where did it go? What is the source of eating dairy on Shavuos? And is one allowed to have a dairy meal as one of the Shavuos meals? Okay, so this is the, the all-important question. What should I eat on Shavuos? So the, the right answer to that is whatever your wife serves, that's what you should eat. You know, if you know it's good for you. But um, I think there's a lot of misconception about this. There is a mitzvah de oiraisa to eat meat on Yom Tif. By which meals? Certainly by the day meals. The connection is very bad. One second. I'm sorry. Very little I could do right now, but I'll try to fix it for next time. Um, there, there's a mitzvah de oiraisa to eat meat on, on Shavuos, on Yom Tif. Um, the mitzvah de Iraisa says that for sure by the day meals I'm obligated to eat meat. In other words, let's start like this. The Gemara says, Ein simcha And therefore, there is a mitzvah de Iraisa to eat meat on Yom Tif. So, lahalacha, if I wanted to eat, let's say, meat at night and milchiks during the day, it's a wrong thing to do. You cannot have a milchik meal on Yom Tif during the day. You should not do it. should not do it. Is it Usr? It's not Usr, but it's incorrect. Why is it incorrect? Because there is not a, not a chiyuv, a mitzvah, the oiraisa, to have meat during the day on Yom Tif. So if you're going to have to have a milchik meal, day meal, it is not the correct thing to do. So tell your wife now, she should not serve a milchik day meal. It's against the halacha. What about a milchik night meal? So the, the night meal is more lenient. Let me explain why. 
The Shagas Arye is of the opinion that the mitzvah of eating meat on Yom Tif does not apply to the first night. It does apply to every subsequent night. In other words, it would not be correct to have a milchik meal on Pesach by any of the night meals except for the first night. The first night though, the Shagas Arye is of the opinion the mitzvah of Simchas Yom Tif did, did, did not begin yet. However, the Shagas Arye says it is a mitzvah de Rabbanon, but it's not a mitzvah de Iraisa. On the other hand, the Magen Avram disagrees, and the Magen Avram says there is a mitzvah deraisa of simcha on on uh, the first night. So, if you want to know what is the, am I allowed to have a dairy meal on Shavuos? The answer is, if you're going to have a dairy meal, you need to do it at night. You should not do it during the day. Is it uh, ideal to have a dairy meal at night? I can't say it's the most ideal thing to do because you have a mitzvah da'iraisa to eat meat according, for sure during the day and according to the Magen Avram at night also. So what's the best thing to do? The best thing to do is not to have a dairy meal but rather, I'm sorry that the, the connection is a little wobbly, the best thing to do is you don't have a dairy meal during the day after davening, you make a bissel kiddush, you have a dairy kiddush, you wash out your mouth, you, rinse out, uh, you eat something, you drink something, and then you have a fleshic meal. Uh, that's the best thing to do. So again, the best thing is that the meal should be basar, because it's a mitzvah dairaisa, and if you want to have dairy, you have a little bit of dairy in the beginning of the meal. In other words, you have a kiddush on dairy. Am I allowed to have a dairy meal? There's a heter to have a dairy meal, but only during the night and not during the day. Is it correct to have a dairy meal during the day? It is not correct to have a dairy meal during the day. That's the basic uh, guideline. I'm sure people have questions on this, but uh, that's the halacha. Yeah, does that... You're good with that? You're not good with that? You're tired? You want to know if we're having minion tomorrow? You want to know what does that good to say? What does the OU say? I don't know about that. But I'm just telling you, if you want to have a dairy meal, it should be the night meal, preferably. Does fish count as meat? No, fish is not meat. Fish does not count as meat. No. If you, if you want to have a dairy meal, can you ask another rub? Ah, oh, if you want to ask... <laughs> Avi Schreier, I'm happy that in this matzah you still haven't uh, missed a beat. Was that you, Avi? That was me. See? How do you like that? Um, yeah. If you want to ask another Rav? Uh, what is the question to be answered? I guess if, it depends if you ask this Rav. It's, you know what it depends on? Whether asking a question on a Zoom has a din of asking a Shaila. You know, it could be, it doesn't even have a din of asking a Shaila. When somebody asks a question on a Zoom, it's more of a, you know, entertainment ba'alma. It's not style. Not I really want to hear. It depends what your kavana and asking the Shiloh was. Okay. Um, anything else? Yeah, I got one more question. Um, what, basically we know the halacha is that one should not excessively praise somebody in the presence of others because if I say that this person is, you know, unbelievable, X, Y, and Z, uh, someone is bound to say, nah, but yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. So what do I do at a Sheva Brachas? Am I allowed to exaggerate how good somebody is? Um, and what about the halacha that one should not praise somebody publicly? So basically what we say is within reason. In other words, there's a very interesting Taz. The Taz says that when you're giving a hesped for somebody, you're allowed to exaggerate a little bit. So what kind of halacha is that? Either you're allowed to lie, you're not allowed to lie. If you're not allowed to lie, then you're not allowed to lie a little bit. If you're allowed to lie, you should be able to exaggerate a lot. But basically the Taz says that everybody is really a little bit better than they are because chances are if they had the opportunity to do a little bit more than they were given, they would probably do a little bit more. So there's such an idea that you're allowed to sort of say that someone is a little bit better than they are. People understand, you know, if, if you make somebody just a little bit better than they actually are, it will not prompt that kind of reaction, yeah, but. It's the exaggerated comment. Um, but, but at a Shavar Bracha, sort of people expect that, you know, 
the things that you say may not be 100% accurate. It's sort of begeder, you know, if somebody buys a new suit, and they ask you what your opinion is, so you're obligated to say, uh, yeah, it's a nice suit, because uh, they're sort of stuck with it. So, you know, the chassan and kala, they're sitting there, they're married already, so what are you going to say to the kala? You know, you blew it, what kind of, what kind of big mistake did you make? You know, it's, it's no, no different than you're allowed to tell the kala she has a nice dress, certainly you're allowed to tell her she got a good chassan. So, you're allowed to exaggerate with the, with the comments about what somebody's wearing, you could certainly exaggerate about um, at a Sheva Brachas. That's all, folks. Uh, anybody have any other questions? Because I, um, those are all the questions that came in, unless I'm missing one. Rabbi, a good yamtiv. Good yamtiv, good yamtiv. We'll see you Sunday. There's a Sashem. Out here in L.A. Uh, I wish I could be there. On Zoom. <laughs> anybody, any other questions? Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Um, will the rabbi continue his share on the Sefer Yamim? Oh, Chemda Sayamim, is that what you mean? Okay, you want to know, three years ago I gave a share on Chemda Sayamim. Why, why um, haven't I continued that series? Okay, so the, the honest answer is like this. So three years ago I gave this share about the Chemda Sayamim, who was written by, was written by the prophet of Shabtai Tzvi, or was it an accurate source? And we said that many G'daylam have vouched for it. And I was looking for, there was an approach given by a Rabbi Yari. In fact, um, the G'dalia got me a book about this um, from Amsterdam in an in, in in ancient bookstore. The only thing is, after looking into that Sefer, um, there's a lot of controversy about that approach. And... Um, I spoke to a certain historian who did not agree with that approach, so I sort of uh, left the subject. That's what I'll say about it publicly. Anyway, uh, any other questions? Okay, Rabbi Isai, thank you for listening. Until next time, have a great night. Shkayach. Does the Rav listen to music? What do you mean, do I listen to music? In general? Or during Sphira? Or you want to know about... Um, you want to know about, uh, in general, do I listen to music? Yeah, sure, I listen to music. I, Rav Moshe, has a tshuva that you shouldn't listen to music. That tshuva, Rav Moshe, was really not Neskabel. You want to know who do I listen to? I'm a big MBD fan, that's the truth. But I can't, the two more questions would be too personal in nature. But I happen to like MBD, how's that? But, uh, but I will tell you, during Sphira, um, what, what has been pretty prevalent is to listen to a cappella. And if you look in the Poiskim, they are not endorsing the practice of listening to a cappella music. And the reason is because if it's on a tape, they feel that it's very, very similar to very similar to uh, actual music. So I, I would definitely recommend, and I don't want to c come out with any public statement on this, that um, during Sphira, firstly, a person needs to ask two Shilas. We know that we keep Sphira, for the most part, for 33 days. But that might only be for haircut. For music, there are many Paiskim who say that music applies for the whole Sphira. So, that's a question that you need to determine. Everyone needs to determine, ask their Paisik. Okay, I, I take haircuts for 16 days of Sphira. Do I listen to music after Lag Boimer or do I only listen to music on Lag Boimer? It's a very important Shaila everybody needs to look into. The other Shaila is, and I'm not going to give you an answer to that, is it permitted to listen to a cappella? Um, these are all questions that people should be Mavara. Um, and that's all, folks. I'll see everybody tomorrow. Bracha v'hatzlacha, feel good, and have a great night. Shkayach. You've just experienced another Torah class, brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.